Good morning, monsters, and welcome to this week's episode of Monsters on the Edge on the Untold Radio Network. We have an awesome show, guys, for you today with some of the cast of Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. we got a couple of them backstage, and hopefully we get a couple more coming in throughout the show tonight or this morning, wherever you're watching us, uh, because, uh, you know, internet in Alaska is not always what it's supposed to be, and uh, we got some guys that hopefully can make it in as well. But we do have some of them backstage, and we're going to get to that in just a minute or two. So, guys, if you want to show your support for the Untold Radio Network, here's how. Hey, Untold Radio Network fans. Want exclusive perks and to support our channel? Introducing our YouTube membership program with three amazing levels. Get loyalty badges that level up to different cryptids the longer you're a supporter. How cool is that? You'll also get access to custom Bigfoot emojis and priority in chat. Upgrade to Backstage Pass for exclusive wallpapers, photos, status updates, discounted books, and merchandise. Go all in with the producer level for everything mentioned plus member shoutouts. Ready for an enhanced experience? Join now, pick your membership level, and let's make this journey even more exciting together. All right, guys, we have a brand new member of the Untold Radio Network family, Jill. Uh, Is it Herrera? is a new super chats member so thank you so much for being a uh, super chats member and a fan here on the untold radio network if you guys uh, are interested head on over to the wisconsin caps youtube page and check out what we got going on over there Are you interested in the paranormal, ghosts, spirits, and the metaphysical? How about Mothman, Bigfoot, and other cryptids? What about UFOs, UAPs, and other anomalous phenomenon? Then you need to check out Cryptids, Anomalies, and the Paranormal Society. We have all that and more. Watch our series, Caps Road Trip, where we travel across the U.S. in search of these phenomena and bring you not only the history of these locations, events, and encounters, but evidence that we capture along the way. Alongside our team of researchers and investigators, you never know who will be joining in on the investigations. Are you interested in Bigfoot in Upper Michigan? Check out Finding Heighton, a series documenting the Sasquatch activity on a very special 80-acre property just outside of Menominee that has been a hot spot since 2012. Want even more? Check out our podcasts. Whispers from the Dark is the official podcast of Cryptids, Anomalies, and the Paranormal Society and brings you interviews with the top names in the field of paranormal to cryptids and more. Hear witnesses' accounts and go in-depth with the CAPS team to hear more about our ongoing research. Are you more into cryptids? Find links to our all-cryptid show, Monsters on the Edge, on the Untold Radio Network. If you're into spooky, subscribe now and you won't miss a minute of our brand new series coming soon, Spirits of Macville. Follow along as we uncover the haunted history dating back to 1877 of a very well-known location you may have never guessed would be haunted. Head on over to YouTube and hit that subscribe button and you won't miss a minute. That's right, guys. And we also have a uh, On the Trail of Undiscovered Beasts is on the Paraflix Paranormal Plus streaming platform. It is $3.99 a month, and you can use promo code CAPS10 to get 10% off your first three months. If you want to show your support, you can head on over to WisconsinCaps.com, click on Shop Our Store. There you can get t-shirts and tote bags and mugs, pins, magnets, and all other things with the CAPS logos, and show and wear your support. While you're online, head on over to all of our social media platforms at Patreon, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can find us at Wisconsin Caps or WI Caps on Instagram. Guys, I am excited to announce that I have a brand new book coming out. It will be available January 1st on Amazon. It is a 248-page book documentary documenting 
the Bigfoot activity at the Hayden Adventure in Upper Michigan, a special 80 acres of private property that has been a hot spot of activity since it was featured on Finding Bigfoot for a trail camera image you can see on the cover there back in 2012. So January 1st, that will be available on Amazon. It is full color book. And uh, hopefully I will have some for sale this weekend as well at CryptidCon. That brings us to this. Coming up this weekend, guys, the Caps team is on the road. We are going to be at CryptidCon in Lexington, Kentucky this weekend. If you guys are going to be out there, it's going to be a great event with all great names in cryptozoology. And even some paranormal people are going to be there. And then December 3rd, we are going to be at the Krampus Festival in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And coming up next year, on uh, May 18th, we are going to be at the Hodag Heritage Festival in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And June 1st, we are going to be at the Marinette Menominee Bigfoot and Paranormal Convention. And guys, that brings us to our live Q&A. <laughs> This is going to be a good show, guys. Uh, so we have a few of the members of, oops, there we go, a few of the members of the Alaskan Killer Bigfoot TV series. Uh, they got some very cool things to talk about, and uh, this is going to be a very awesome live Q&A. So if you guys have any questions for the cast, put them in the comments section because this is as much your show as it is mine today. So feel free to put them over there. If you want to put them in all caps, that will give me a good... Uh, a visual reference to get them on there and uh, be able to see them a lot easier and get them answered for you guys. So I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves individually. So first up, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Davis. Welcome to the show. Hello, Barnaby. I'm glad to be here. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a master's in archaeology. And uh, I worked uh, not in Alaska, but for the U.S. Forest Service uh, in the Cascade Mountains of Washington and Oregon. And I just am really interested in the odd and unusual. And I've been on several television shows having to do with ghosts, as well as perhaps really my favorite is Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. All right. And up next, we have Kyle McDowell. How are you doing, Kyle? You're muted, just so you know. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me today. Um, yeah. So I'm Kyle McDowell um, on Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. I was a um, I was the bear guard and also um, a tracker, um, helping out the crew just to kind of keep safe from wildlife and stuff like that. Um, I do bear guard work as part of my um, company that I own in Seward, Alaska, which is Kenai Backcountry Adventures. We specialize in everything from bear tours mountaineering, um, winter adventures and things like that. Um, personally, I've been adventuring, um, all over Alaska for close to, um, close to 20 years now. Um, I've been all over, um, my experience is largely more out in the mountains in the backcountry than it is really anywhere else. Um, and that's taken me into some pretty far and wide and really deep places. And, um, still to this day, I have not experienced um, some of what I experienced out of Portlock anywhere in Alaska. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both for joining me today. Uh, we had a couple other members that are supposed to be here, and uh, hopefully they're uh, going to pop in throughout the show. So this is what we got for now, and I'm, I'm excited. I mean, you guys are awesome. I know, Jeff, I've talked to you before, and Kyle, I think this is the first time that I've met you and got to talk to you. So this should be a good time. Yeah, so, uh, sure. Ah, uh, I, I know this is a terrible question, but uh, it's what we got in the comments so far. I'm so sorry. Um, Mr. Mr. Duffy 81 uh, says, who did Bigfoot kill? And uh, it says, I mean, I know about the cannery people, but has there been any deaths lately? Uh, I don't think there have been any deaths lately. Part of it, this this will sound like a kind of a, a, a common sense answer. Uh, not a lot of people go to Portlock, and so there aren't as many opportunities for Nantanak to disappear or kill people, or, or let's face it, have people fall off the edge of a ravine uh, and die, or or like Ash when Ash was down the mine shaft. Um, 
you need to have people go someplace in order to put them in danger. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very yeah. Awesome. I would, I would probably add to that too, that, um, you know, the, uh, the stories and, um, just what people have seen and observed, um, in and around Portlock, apparently whatever those, um, creatures, Nuntinuk, um, whoever it is or whatever it is, um, seems to travel some pretty great distances too, or maybe there's more of them, um, in the area. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people that just disappear in Alaska and go missing. Um, and while it may not be exactly say right smack dab in Portlock, um, there's definitely people have disappeared in and around that greater area. Um, and we're talking like people disappearing, like just vanishing without a trace. Um, just like they were there and just gone. Um, so, you know, what, what's that? Um, <laughs> I guess we don't know, but that's, that's still a piece we got to consider. Yeah. Let's, uh, I, I kind of jumped right into questions there. Let's back up a little bit. Jeff, can you tell us, uh, for those of you who may be just listening for the sake of the show and that, what what is the story behind Portlock and uh, the premise of the show, Alaskan Killer Bigfoot? Uh, sure. It's, and I've got to, before I even start launching into, uh, into written historical facts, I've got to point out that, of course, Native people have been uh, in, in Alaska, thousands and thousands of years. And in, in some cases people have, have been there and then they have moved on and other people have come in and replaced them. Then again, there's some other native peoples who the archeology span suggests have been in one spot for these thousands of years. And, and we don't know all of their stories. And, and hopefully this is partly why we're hoping for, uh, for uh, to be renewed for more seasons so we can explore this but um historically uh the, the kind of the, where a lot of people i think want want to know most is uh really the beginning of the 20th century where portlock alaska is, is located it wasn't the town site uh that had been uh used off and on for centuries uh by the native peoples for uh as a fishing spot in a village spot they lived there they hunted and fished around there but uh in the late 1800s to early 1900s uh a cannery operation went in and and it grew over the decades to the point where at its height in the 1940s uh they had 100 seasonal employees with the fishing fleet and in the cannery itself they were fishing salmon um, and of course canning them and shipping them out and so there's a tremendous increase in population at Portlock and um, in those decades uh, maybe two dozen maybe even more like Ed Kyle said some people just disappear so imagine you've got this transitional population of, of workers and somebody might show up to get a job and then they disappear the next day and nobody people just think they moved on where they may have actually met more nefarious end but about two dozen people who were cannery workers or were part of the local population uh, ended up going missing most of them were going up hunting into the into the mountains and and they they disappeared and some of their bodies uh after the rains uh, washed, washed down into the into the seasonal streams and rivers, and then into the lagoon, uh, which which is part of part of the Portlock town site. And they were uh, severely they were killed violently. And uh, some people from from the lower forty eight states might say, "Well, it was probably a bear." Uh, what made this really frightening to everybody is they kind of knew what what somebody had been killed by a bear what what it looked like and these people were not killed by a bear and mm. one gentleman was getting ready to go hunting when he was attacked uh, he survived long enough to tell people that was this big hairy creature that came out of the woods and attacked him he had his hunting dogs and they drove it off and he survived just long enough to pass that story on so we're getting into the late 1940s, and um, and there were there people living in the town. There are there are high hills uh, surrounding part of the town, and they would hear screams and cries, and and rocks and boulders would be rolling down the hillside and banging into houses, and and then the crying and screaming would go on at night too. And and so it was in the middle of the night. Finally, 
everybody had had enough. Uh, earlier, they'd even had armed guards at the entrance and the exits to the cannery to protect the workers, and they had just had enough. And literally in the middle of the night, they they packed up their stuff and left. Um, about the only person who was left for a couple of days was the postmaster because he needed permission to actually close the post office down. Wow. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the tribal corporation still owns the land and they moved to uh, another site uh, some miles away. And, and uh, in, in air miles is probably not very far, but travel-wise, Kyle knows better than me how long it takes sometimes to travel short distances, uh, but they're outgrowing their settlement. They, they simply not enough land there. And this is, they want to go back and perhaps uh, reopen, well, restart the town, but reopen a cannery and who knows what they can do economically, but they want to find out uh, if it's safe for everybody. Absolutely. So that's that's where the premise of the show is. And from what I've heard, you know, when when um, they started filming this, it was a show about just resettling Portlock. It had nothing to do with Bigfoot. And as the the show went on and you guys are out there, you know, doing the, the research and, and rediscovering the area and that just more and more of these things started happening and it, it developed into what it is. Uh, as you were saying, Jeff, I looked it up on a map. From what I can tell, actual mileage, it's about 10 miles from uh, Nanwalik to uh, Portlock. But again, you know, like you said, it's it's all through, you know, rugged terrain and stuff, which is probably nothing for one of these creatures. So it's, it's a very small area. But um, anyway, I, I would like to know, like, Kyle, we were talking about these bear attacks and stuff like that with with bears killing people and that and obviously there's a reason why you were on the show to protect the cast and all that so how how prevalent is this and like what what can you say like do you think that these were bear attacks uh that drove the people out of there or what is your opinion on that yeah that's um that's a great question and so I kind of take it back to a lot of the um, the written um, historical accounts that folks left. Um, people, you know, you have to you have to kind of take a step back a little bit in the sense that these people that were living out there back in this time frame were some of the most rugged people on on the planet. Okay, um, I mean, what they were doing is foreshadows anything we do in our daily existence today they had to basically just i mean everything they got for food they had to get themselves um i mean they had to make their own way truly in a very hostile austere type of wilderness environment right um which by today's standards that area is extremely remote and it's extremely harsh like it's like no joke to get out there whether you go by plane whether you go by boat, whatever, like, I mean, it's a risk just going there. Um, people die out in Cook Inlet, Catchamac Bay all the time due to the seas and whatnot. But anyways, with that said, these people were used to encounter, encountering bears on a regular basis, right? So they're going out into these environments where it's the animal's domain and they're saying, hey, us humans are moving in and we're going to take this over, right? And so essentially what they're doing is they're having to build their, their society, their, their towns and whatever, and they're pushing the animals out, much like we've done all over the, the world, right? Um, but for them to encounter uh, grizzly bears was just like an everyday normal occurrence, right? And the mindset um, that people had of bears back in that day were that they were just vicious killer attack animals that if, if a bear sees you, it's just going to kill you. Um, and I'll say that's not the case. It certainly can be the case, but they're not inclined to just want to kill a human. Okay. Um, but that's how they thought about it. So a lot of times whenever they saw bears, they would just kill them. Okay. Um, and that's the, because they've had people have been mauled and maimed and killed by, by grizzly bears. So just as it was a normal occurrence for them to move into an environment and encounter grizzly bears, it was also relatively somewhat common for people within their settlement um, to also be attacked or killed by grizzly bears. Um, so when you sort of take that into account, we're like today, 
people, yes, they still get attacked and maimed and killed by grizzly bears, but it's not as common um, as I'm sure it was back then. So they would have a sort of real time current events look and knowledge of what it looks like and what it means to be killed or maimed by a grizzly bear. Mm -hmm. So when you take that into the context of what these people are saying that they're like, look, this isn't a bear. Like what I saw is not a bear or these tracks are not bear tracks or the way this guy's arms were ripped off of his torso is not something a bear would do. Right. So, um, when these people can, especially the, the gentleman that survived for a momentary uh, period of time, when he can say that without a shadow of a doubt, it wasn't a bear. This isn't some dude who just rolled up from San Francisco on a steamship and jumped into Alaska and one day later had this encounter. Like he's been living out in this environment. He knows what bears are. Um, they're an everyday type of, you know, occurrence for them, just like us, you know, seeing something in our normal everyday life that was normal for them. So he, they're going to know, right. They're going to have that context to know. Um, so by reading those firsthand accounts um, and hearing the stories and the information that Jeff was able to drum up and source and everything, um, which was just absolutely mind boggling. And it, and it goes back so many years and you have so many people saying the same thing over and over and over from different nationalities to different generations to several generations of the people from Nan Wallach. Um, just, I mean, one generation after another are telling these same stories. And it's like, over time, it's like, man, all these people can't be seeing some like this has to be real at some point, right? The, this many people can't be making this up. Um, so by those written accounts and the way they described the, um, the damage to the bodies, um, that's just not what bears do. Um, I don't really want to go into detail to what bears do, but it's pretty, the information is readily available on the internet. Bears have a pretty particular way. And when I'm say bears, I'm mainly referring to brown bears or grizzly bears. Um, they have a very particular sort of MO, if you will, of when they do attack somebody, um, they kind of do a similar type of attack to any human. Um, and even if they are to completely kill that human out of whatever reason it happens to be, because sometimes they do do that, um, they don't do what they, what they did to those people in Portlock. Very good. Now, I, I want to ask you this question, you know, everybody that's on, you know, skeptical of the existence of these, these creatures always points to the thing of, you know, well, we see bears all the time in the woods, you know, we see the skeletons or all the stuff. And, and I know that that's not very common. So on, on the fact of this, on your time at Portlock, just in that little bit of uh, the time that you were there and stuff, how many bears did you actually see? In, in the vicinity of that? Um, I think it, like, I think it was only one bear. Um, like I can remember one bear in particular um, and it, it got to the point, this was towards the tail end and this wasn't shown because we didn't go out with a camera crew. Um, it was myself, Keith and DJ. Um, we just woke up one morning and we were like, let's just kind of hightail it out of here a little bit and go do some exploring and just see if we can find some bears because it just wasn't making any sense that we weren't seeing bears. The only bear we had found up to that point was a dead bear. It was a skeleton of a bear. Um, and so um, we had ventured out. Um, we went to an area. Um, I, I said, if there's going to be any bears around here anywhere, they're for sure going to be here. We did end up seeing one and it was a, it was a massive black bear, probably one of the biggest black bears um, I've ever seen. And, um, that was it. Um, and aside from bears, I mean, there was just sort of an overall lack of wildlife, um, in general, it was pretty bizarre. Um, like I said, I, I do this stuff all over Alaska, not only for my backcountry expeditions, but the bear guard work. Um, I've been, you know, virtually everywhere and every type of, um, geographic environment as well from deciduous forest, boreal forest, high tundra, you know, you name it. Um, and there's, there's always wildlife. I mean, at least birds and, you know, small ground animals and things like that. And, uh, we just weren't really seeing that. And when we would see an animal, it was usually like, it was like killed or something like that, that otter, the sea otter and stuff like that. Um, and, and then we saw a, um, a fox that was super weird, bizarre, sort of the way it came into our, 
our environment and the way it sort of interacted with us and then left. Um, looking back on it, kind of have some, you know, sort of potential ideas of what, what that could have been, um, especially after what I learned and heard from being there for so long. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, while we should have seen a lot of bears and of course other animals, we just really, just really didn't. <clears throat> Yeah, um, and I'm going to take this a little bit sideways, uh, talking about human beings being there. Uh, there, there has been some archaeology work done there, uh, essentially, and this is a very broad timeline. I'm not going to try and give you the exact year and date, but 1949-1950 is when they abandoned the town. Uh, early 1900s was really the first start of the factory. It, and, and cannery. But remember in the early 1960s, there was this massive, uh, massive earthquake and tsunami that came, came up the, uh, up the inlet. And, uh, and, and Kyle, I think you and I had traded some emails about, uh, if you've ever saw footage of Fukushima, where, uh, from, from the air, it looks like it's in slow motion when the water from the, from the tidal wave came in. And so, it had to have the abandoned town of Portlock, maybe 15, 10, 15 years abandoned. Everything was probably still standing. The water came in and it pushed everything up. But then once it, once it receded, it pulled things out. And so they're not quite sure uh, where everything was, but archeology span work has been done. And what they found is that uh, there've been native occupations on that land site several times where they were there they occupied it they they live long enough there to to you know leave their leave their garbage and and layers and fires and layers and then then it's abandoned for decades if not centuries and then they're back and and so this is when you talk about not finding animals there well human beings were animals too so and smaller animals as well as us bigger animals don't seem to be there for huge periods of time. Wow. Well, so I don't, I don't know your full history, Kyle, but if you can try and like talk about some of the other expeditions that you've been on, you know, we were the, the port lock situation was a 40 day uh, excursion to that area. So have you been on any other uh, bear guard missions that have been a similar time frame? and how, how many bears do you, typically uh, uh see in that time um yeah so um as far as bear guard projects yes i have um similar durations and similar type of projects and um usually you know we see bears um or if not at the very beginning we see a lot of bear sign um a lot of fresh sign and stuff like that which is pretty normal but at some point during the project there's typically some bear um, activity or bear encounters that um, i need to you know deal with and mitigate um, that's also in conjunction with the backcountry type of expeditions I do. So um, we'll actually take people out. We, we do a variety of it. Like I said, kind of from mountaineering to, you know, glacier trekking or rafting or actual bear specific type trips where we'll take people out into the wilderness and we'll go live with grizzly bears for, you know, a week or so at a time. Um, but even like in some of these backcountry trips where we're going out doing like mountaineering objectives and things like that, like we always see bears. <laughs> like there's just it's just very rare that we'll ever go on a trip and not see bears. I mean, right here at my office, we have bears that hang out and come through here in our parking lot, you know, on a regular basis. So they're around, um, you know, everywhere, you know, and it's, uh, something normal. So to go out there and then just like literally not see anything was, was just, it's still bizarre to me. I didn't know if Jeff had something to add there, but <laughs> oh, I, I, w I was actually thinking about, uh, and this is more of a question I have too: uh, cryptozoology and 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 critters that we think have been extinct for long periods of time that aren't. I just saw a headline that uh, it, it's so funny a headline that they they rediscovered this supposedly extinct echidna, which is a very small creature, uh, but. Uh, because of my archaeology background, uh, cave bears, what some people call short snout bears. Um, Kyle, have you ever have you ever seen uh, oh, even for Alaska an overly large bear that that you think this looks like the older prehistoric cousin of what I've always encountered before? 
Yeah, I have. There's uh, there's a couple areas in particular uh, that I go into quite regularly. Um, and there is, I'm not going to say at all where this is, but um, or where these places are, but there's definitely some bears I've seen. Cause I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time with bears um, throughout the summer and I'm not talking about, Oh, I'm in an area and I can see a bear really long ways away. I mean, I'm like very close proximity to bears. So I I've been doing this for a really long time and I've specialized in studying bear behavior and things like that. Um, so I can tell, you know, rather quickly if it's a male or a female and, you know, I can get a pretty good bead on the age and things like that. And, um, there are definitely some areas where, um, I've seen bears that are just way, way larger to where like you see them at first and it looks like an elephant walking across the Serengeti or something, you know, or like a Buffalo out in the plains. And you're just like, Whoa. And I mean, like a few times where it's like, holy crap, I, I really hope this bear does not come over by us right now because, like, this thing is just a freaking monster. Um, you know, a, a good size grizzly bear in, like, this part of Alaska is going to, you know, going to be somewhere around 10, 10 and a half, maybe 11 feet tall. Um, that's a big bear. Um, there's a very... Uh, hind legs or on all fours? So that would be standing on its hind legs, um, would be 10 feet tall. And um, there's a very... Uh, um, there's a very, um, kind of losing, losing my, uh, my, my words here a little bit, but there's a very consistent way to measure a bear, um, paw print and determine the size of the grizzly bear. Um, it's scientifically proven. It's, you know, it's a very reliable, um, way to do it. And there's some areas we go into and we found these bear tracks where you see them at first and it's just like, whoa, this thing's a monster. Then you kind of like look around a little bit like, okay, where is it? Um, and then we'll measure it. And we've measured some that have been over 12 feet tall, um, which is more consistent, like to what you would find down on like Kodiak, um, Kodiak Island and like um, a Fognac Island down in the, the kind of like archipelago area down there. Um, it's not common to have, you know, 11, 12 foot bears just roaming around. There's a lot of people that will um, wholeheartedly um, say that they just don't exist. But, you know, we find their tracks uh, from time to time and we've seen these guys before. Now you have uh, in in the first episode you find some footprints uh, in like this this creek bed and stuff, and I assume you know a lot of people always say, well, they're they're just bare double steps, and I think you are the absolute perfect person to to be able to discredit that. Can you talk about like some of the? There's a, a question here of how much uh, how much other Bigfoot sign was in the area, and you know I think a lot of the main stuff is you know the the footprints and stuff that that we're looking at in the area so can you kind of talk about the difference between a bear double step and the some of the stuff that you were finding and then any other evidence that you found in the area yeah absolutely that's that's a really good question um you know the bear double step or what we call the double tap sometimes you'll see even like a triple um tap um but yeah so that's essentially where you know the bear will either um you know vice versa its rear paw uh, will step over where its front paw was and vice versa on sort of like, you know, subsequent tracks, or if you have multiple bears walking together. And so you'll have, you know, bears, um, front paws have more of a sort of an oval shaped pattern to them with their little toes and whatnot. And then their hind foot, um, looks a lot like a human foot. It's got that long, long gated, um, type pattern. So a lot of times when you see those double steps, it'll be kind of like the footprint will be like this. And it'll look just absolutely massive and people are like, oh my God. Um, for people like me who have been tracking and studying this for a really long time, I can like I can see it like that. Like it just jumps right out at me. Um, but most people see it and they're just like, whoa, look how giant this bear is. You know, it's got a 18 foot or 18 inch, you know, um, footprint. Those footprints um, we found out there, which is, you know, interesting from the show perspective because like, that's something we just sort of stumbled upon. Literally, that was part of like a, a route I would take on my patrol. And one day there was nothing there um, or earlier there was nothing there. Then all of a sudden they were there and we had investigated it for quite some time. And from the show perspective, it was just kind of like, oh, look, there's some prints next. And it went on to the next thing and never really taking the time to dive into it. But those were like when I first saw them, 
I thought it was somebody walked through the mud with their big extra tufts. And I thought maybe it was DJ cause he's got like giant feet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but extra tufts leave a very, you know, they, there's a pattern to the tread, right. And it leaves a very specific tread pattern. But when I first saw it, I'm like, Oh, somebody booted through here in their tufts. And, you know, I kind of walk over looking at it and then I'm just like, okay, wait a minute. This is for sure. Not extra tufts. It was all smooth. Um, you could see, you know, very, you know, defined like foot pattern, you know, or shape of a foot. Um, and then from there, you know, it was like my, my immediate sense was not so much focusing on those footprints. It was more like, okay, I'm on guard now. Like, where is this thing? Whatever it is, right? Like, where is it? Um, so that was a, a very interesting piece of like what I would say, like, do I know it's Bigfoot? Is, do, can I sit there and say it's, it's a Bigfoot sign? I mean, I don't know because I, I don't have anything to compare that to. Right. But it wasn't somebody super big, extra tough. It wasn't somebody walking through their barefoot, not a human, I should say, not walking through their barefoot. Um, I stood next to it. Um, at that time out there, I don't know, like with my gear, I was probably 210, 215, something like that. Um, 215 pounds. And I stood next to that, that footprint and I barely made an impression in that mud. And then I even like, you know, pushed my weight down to see if I could smush my foot down in it. And I, my, my foot was going in maybe like, you know, half inch, inch at best. Those things were in like that deep. Um, and it was like a super clean pattern across it. And then the interesting thing about it was though, um, outside. So the direction it was walking, it sort of like just took this like path across this edge of this muddy thing, like a little slough, like a muddy slough. And so I was tracking it on the other side and the footprints walked into the grass and then they just were gone. Um, there was, there was no more, um, footprints. So you could see where it went through. You could see where there's a couple steps like up in the grass where it literally was smushing the grass down into the mud and then boom, it was gone. Um, so that was, that was like, mind you, like right at the very beginning, um, where, you know, my whole take on this thing was like, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't like, I wasn't going into this as a Bigfoot guy. Right. Like, and this is no, no offense to, to anybody out there. I just, I wasn't like this hardcore Bigfoot cryptid guy or something like that. Uh, but I've always had an open mind because I've seen and I've heard other things out in the wilderness and whatnot. And that's sort of my, my take on it was like, I don't know it is real, but I don't know it's not real. And it was more like, you know, kind of like wanting to see it or see some proof to know it is. I actually would have loved and sort of part of me would have loved to have actually seen this thing, but then there's always that side of you like, like, oh, like, okay, what if you do see it? Like, what's actually going to happen, right? Um, so we had a lot of other stuff happen, and it, a lot of it seemed to happen in the beginning where, like, probably for me, the most definitive thing in the beginning because as we stayed out there longer, things just got weirder and weirder and weirder and it escalated and it compounded and it sometimes happened in such rapid concession that it was almost hard for your brain to keep up with it. It was like you're processing what just happened and then boom, something else would happen. That was just like, this is like, you know, like bat crap, crazy type stuff that's happening. And so your brain's just like, okay, like, is this something I need to fight or flight? Like what, what's going yeah. on right now? But probably one of the most early on definitive things was the the tree knocking. Um, and it was for me, it was like, OK, like this is this has got to be one of the most definitive pieces of, of an intelligent being out there because we were all together as a crew. It was the entire crew. It was all the cast. It was all of us. We were together and it's shown in the in the show. But we were. Um, hanging up some trail cameras and Ash took out his ax and he was chopping off some branches to make room to strap the camera on there. And, you know, he was like chop, 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 you know, chop, chop. It wasn't like a chop, chop, chop. It was a, you know, very just sort of natural, you know, unregulated tempo or rhythm, right? There was no specific cadence or whatever to it. And after you got done chopping and doing that, like we heard the tree knocking and I, I say tree knocking, but it sounded like two pieces of wood hitting each other. Right. Um, was it something hitting a tree? I don't know, but it sounded for sure like two pieces of wood hitting each other, but it was in the exact same tempo and cadence and rhythm and pattern is what he did with his ax. 
and we were all just like holy crap like and it was one of those moments where you're like okay i know i heard it everybody else heard it and it was going on for some time that we were able to like you know process it in our brains a little bit and then we're just kind of like whoa all looking at each other like okay we we all heard that right and everybody's like yeah and the camera guys you know and everybody on the film crew their eyes are like wide open like and the audio dude's like oh yeah i heard it you know and and um so i was like ash i was like do that again like hit the tree again and just do some like random weird rhythm and he did and we're waiting and it mimicked it again and I don't know if it if that part made it in the show, and I just I'm not recalling it right off the top of my head, <clears throat> um, but it did it again, and that was that was early on in the the time we were there. And to me, that was like okay, it's something with intelligence. There's no other humans out there. We were the only humans out there, right? Like if there was any other humans coming out there, we would know because there's one way into that place, and we're very vigilant about making sure if, some, if other people were coming into our environment, we would know they were there. Right. Um, and so it wasn't a squirrel, you know, bears don't pick up logs and hit trees. I mean, something picked up some piece of wood and hit another piece of wood and did it in a mimicking fashion and sort of fast forward through this port lock process that seemed to be a characteristic of whatever it is out there. Um, it had this, ability or technology to mimic sounds um, and mimic things like that it wanted us to hear. Um, and that happened on just numerous, numerous occasions. Um, and so not being the Bigfoot guy, I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to look for, but then other people started finding things like the, the leaned over trees and the snapped over trees. And then we started finding footprints in the moss and so on. So anyways, I know it was a long kind of like, monologue there but it's just there's a lot there's, there's a, so many things packed into what happened out there and i'll just say one more thing while i'm thinking about it so i was keeping a journal because there, we're having all these crazy things happening so at the end of the day i would i would journal the crazy things that happened you know like oh my gosh this happened just so i could recount it and sort of keep a, a log of it um after several days it just kept happening more and more and more frequently that I just, I quit putting it in my journal because it was too much. It'd start out as maybe 10 things a day then 20, then it was like 50, then it was just like all the time. And so much of that, you saw maybe 1% of what actually happened in the show. Yeah. Can I, um, can I jump in? Please do. One of the, um, Kyle, really Kyle's testimony, Kyle, you know, everything he just told us, um, is, is actually very important when you're doing these kind of investigations, uh, whether it be, you know, ghost hunting or, or, uh, going to, going to port lock to, to look at, at resettling and finding this stuff happening, turning into investigation is, uh, when you have witnesses who know virtually nothing about say about Bigfoot or about the paranormal, uh, having all these experiences, and then you can go back to the written record, the historic record, and the the, the folk tales, the ethnographies, and and cross compare. And then uh, there's a difference between something correlating in in causation. But when you have uh, when you have things like Kyle's just described, uh, which includes uh, the, the the tree knocking, the 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 voices. Uh, and, and, and these various other things, and then looking through the ethnographies uh, up and down the the, the the Pacific coast, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, uh, it, it, which I did for for this, was looking at all this stuff, and the native people talked about various things that very much parallel exactly what Kyle, who didn't know about it, had. For instance, uh, according to some traditions, uh, what we call Bigfoot, we lump them together, Sasquatch. Uh, they're actually in some areas were two different, two different breed species, whatever populations. One of them, which is what we traditionally think of being very, very big and tall, um, it was one of them. But there's another uh, wild people of the forest who are actually very short, maybe even shorter than ordinary human beings. But they had the ability to mimic human voices and a lot of times would make bird calls. And, and one of the things 
when when the parents would hear that what they recognized as this this Sasquatch call uh, sound like bird noises, they would take extra special care of their kids because it seemed to be hypnotic and people w who were unaware would seem to be hypnotized and they would go out and they would just simply disappear. Uh, another function of these smaller big feet was they actually, they carried clubs, they carried magic, magic wands. They're not, not short, but very much like a, a quarter staff. And they would, uh, those were imbued with magic and they would hit trees and they would be knocking over trees. They had that kind of ability and power. And so that was also one of the ways you could tell if in ancient times, if you shouldn't be in that part of the woods, you start hearing the tree knocking. And mm. I think uh, many other different places across North America have, have very similar traditions. So, uh, so again, Kyle didn't know about these legends, didn't know about these uh, individually named characteristics and, and events. And yet here he experienced them as a neutral person. So is that is really important. Absolutely. The fact that we touched on this earlier as well, you know, you're talking about these people that live off the land, you know, and I, I, I talk about this in all the other places around the world, you know, in Africa and the Himalayas and stuff, these people that rely on the land every single day in, in and out to, to feed themselves and to clothe themselves and shelter and everything, they know what's in these woods. And when you're saying, well, you know, this isn't out there, they, they must have mistaken it or something. You, you're wrong. Because these people are there living this day in and day out every single day. They know every animal, every tree, everything that's in there because their their survival depends on it in a lot of cases. And you know, when when you're looking at these things, that you got to take these reports and these these stories and folklore and everything you know to heart because they they have no reason to make this stuff up and and their life depends on it. You know. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Very true. Yeah, and. Um... Oh, I, I've got to ask you this, Kyle. Uh, one of the things that would set my teeth on edge uh, would be walking down, and, and things happen like this to me, not with Bigfoot, I think, but when I was working the Cascade Mountains, is you're, you're walking down the trail, and then you start seeing the tracks, and, uh, and you start following the tracks, and then you kind of go back the way you came and you find that they're now behind you so you thought you were tracking something and it turns out no it circled yeah. around and is tracking you uh did that did that happen at port lock um it in a in a way um the way that happened was um was a little bit more maybe uh playful or maybe even sinister where we would walk through an area because we did a lot of exploring out there. Like, I mean, you have to, you have to remember, like we were out in the field 12 to 16 hours a day. Um, and they couldn't, they couldn't possibly film all of that. Um, while they tried to do as much as they could, there's also times where the film crews got to take breaks and, you know, we're not taking breaks. We're still, we're just like, we're out here to do this. But what would happen is we'd go into an area and we'd come back and there'd be like a tree, like over the trail. Um, and probably one of the weirdest things, um, kind of goes along with this, but there was this, there was this, uh, area we would traverse through to go from kind of where this large boiler thing was, where we heard the tree knocking, we would travel it was really the only good way to travel through. And we would travel through this area to get over to where the, uh, the obelisk was. And, we had done this route over and over and over and over and over. We did it in the day. We did it at night. We like did it at every hour of the day, um, 8 million times. And we're coming back one night and there's this perfectly clean, I mean, perfectly clean, pristine Mason jar sitting at the base of this tree right next to the trail. And we were, it was late. We had been out there a really long time. Everybody's like, I just want to go back to camp. I just like, I just, like, we're done. Everybody's just smoked. Everybody's fried. And I'm like, I'm like, wh wh like, what's like, what is this? This was not here. And the audio guy, Rob's like, dude, you're, you are 100% right. It is not there. Everyone else was kind of like, ah, whatever. Let's just go. We can look at it tomorrow. And I'm like, no, this is like something, this is weird. Like this freaking 
mason jar was not here like i guarantee you and look how clean it is right and then after that we started finding jars placed at like root balls and like bases of trees like all over the place after that so that was like another way you know and it was like and it was in areas we had spent a ton of time in like around that crazy spooky tree or scary tree or whatever you want to call it like we spent a lot of time in that area and we would go back there one day and there'd be a jar sitting on a root um just stuff like that you know but you know there would be areas where there'd be like a tree and it wasn't like oh that tree just happened to fall over it was like a dead tree it was a log that had been laying in the you know forest floor for a while and it was picked up moved over and set on our trail and stuff like that interesting Mm -hmm. yeah teeth on edge yeah yeah, I think it's it was a it was a pretty it was a pretty tricky place to track out there because the, um you know, the large majority of the forest floor is the very mossy kind of subalpine tundra, um so unless it left a very definitive depression in that tundra, we call it like my name for it, sort of jokingly is spundra because it's when you walk on it it feels like a sponge and you can step and then after you like your foot comes off it'll go like it'll rise back up back into its normal shape, just like a sponge. Um, so even if something had walked through an area, you may not even ever know we'd walk through areas and sometimes we wouldn't even be able to see our own tracks and in the area, which was nice when it finally snowed. Um, when we had that blizzard, that freak blizzard that just rolled in out of nowhere. Um, that was cool. Cause then we could like, we, we had fresh ground to sort of be able to track from. Yeah, and until the um, until the snow melts, uh, the, the, the footprints are the size that, that they are. You know, you, nobody can say, "Oh, uh, you squelched in the mud and went back and forth." When it's in right. s- with hard snow, that is the size of the foot. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here for you, Kyle. Uh, is there any brown or any polar bear or brown hybrids found recently? Um. Not, I mean, certainly not in our area. Um, some people have made reports about um, some hybrids um, up above the Arctic Circle and stuff like that, like so way, way up in Alaska. Um, but nothing, no reports of it or any sightings or any speculation of anything like in our in our general vicinity. Do you have any polar bears come down that far? No, and it's and I'm very thankful of that because dealing with polar bears is a whole different ball game compared to dealing with grizzly bears and, bra- and black bears. You mean they're not all drinking Coca-Cola with their cubs at Christmas no. time? <laughs> no, polar bears are the, you know, like for the most part, black bears and brown bears are not interested in humans as a food source. Um, they don't look at us and say, oh, mm, yum, that's a meal. Um, but polar bears do, so they will actually go after people. So like if I I always tell, cause we have people will be out in these mountain trips and people will ask, they'll be like, are there polar bears out here? And we're like, no. And if there were, we would not be out here (laughs) because it's just a whole different ball game at that point, dealing with those bears. I've, uh, been to a couple zoos around the country here and they have, um, the actual used polar bear trucks. And they're a good like ten foot wheels up oh, off yeah. the ground, and they're like, "You're st- there's signs in them that says you're still not safe this high up," and it's it's really impressive to see those things in person. So, I can only imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Until you see a polar bear up against something we have comparison to, like you see it up next to a truck or a car or whatever, you just it, your mind can't process how big they are when you just see the animal. But then when you see it walk by a car and its back is like higher than the the roof of the car and it's basically the yeah. size of a car you're you're just like oh my gosh the thing is huge so they'll, they'll walk up to cars and just shake them and just push them like they're nothing and you know if they wanted to they could just push front doors in of you know these village houses and stuff it's just, you know they can do whatever they want jeff did you have something to add there uh no i was just amazed there was um oh there are youtube videos all over the place uh, some years ago um, I watched a, a, a show on a wildlife biologist who had darted a polar bear and, uh, and then they took their little blood samples into their trailer. And so the, the cameras moved into the trailers they're processing and the polar bear woke up. And Uh-oh. the next thing you see is the polar bear's head go through the wall of the trailer 
and it looks left and right at the camera and at the guys. And, uh, it, it, and at that point, the guy starts screaming and the camera stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and this is, this, this is, a, this is the thing we're, uh, you know, we're all safely settled in, in the lower 48 States, uh, and in portions of Alaska too, but, uh, our, us as a species, as human species, we are not that far away from, from being pursued by large critters as a food source, as Kyle put it, like polar bears. Um, and so uh, this is something that in watching a show like this, people should remember what, what kind of, um, is a little, is a little unhappy for me is when you, when you have people who watch these shows and from their living room and their, their popcorn and whatever else, uh, watch it and say, well, that's all phony. That, that's not real. Um, I was up in Alaska with, with, with the guys I, I met Ash and Keith and, and through, through these podcasts, I met Kyle and DJ and guy and they're real. And the stuff that's happening is real. Um, when filming these reality TV shows, especially AKB, uh, every week, you know, you heard a 40 hour work week. Imagine your camera crew is, is filming 60 hours a week of, of footage and somebody has to cull through that and, and try and condense it down into 44 minutes for, uh, for once a week. And so if somebody thinks that, that what, what these guys went through was, was put together or made up, no, if, if anything, it's so hard to, to actually condense everything that happened to them down. And so I just had to be supportive and explain things to an audience, what goes into, uh, this kind of an expedition. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, can I chime in a little bit there on that? Absolutely. Okay. So that is probably one of the, um, I don't know. It's a little bit of that, that topic right there is a bit of a crux and, and Jeff hit the nail on the head. Um, I mean, we're just real guys going out to do a real thing. We're not actors. And some people are like, oh, my God, these guys are acting. They're totally making this stuff up. And what you have to understand, like the way this TV stuff works um, is it's not like what you think it is. And while it's sort of like a docu follow, right, where they're following us around with cameras and stuff like that, what would happen is you got, you know, all these guys out here, right? And we're all kind of type A's and we're all interested in what's going on and we're, we all have sort of like our own sort of interest and thoughts and whatever. And we would stumble upon something that was like a discovery. And all of us are just like, Oh my God, like, look at this. And like, look at that. And like, we're all talking over each other and we're like freaking out. And, you know, and the, the camera guys and the audio guys are just trying to make sense of like our hysterical, whatever. And, and mind you, like there might've been some like sleep um, deprivation and sort of like, you know, <laughs> slap happy sort of, you know, um, stuff going on too. But sometimes what would happen is the producer would have to say, okay, okay, hold on guys. Just, just hit the pause button, stop. Right. And it's like, okay, one at a time, one at a time, what are you even talking about? What's going on right now? And they would ask us questions sometimes just to kind of keep us on track because we're just like a bunch of unchained monkeys running around the forest essentially. And so they would have to reel us back in and mind you, like we just had this like amazing, crazy discovery or some weird thing just happened. And then they're like, OK, like, can you explain like what it is you just saw or what you just found? And so then you would see us trying to articulate that experience in sort of a calm, cool, collected manner um, for this to actually make sense on TV. Because when you have from and, I, and I, you know, we didn't know this. We didn't know how this TV stuff works when you have an audio guy he's we're all mic'd up like we all have mics on and he's listening to all of us like he can hear all of us and so when we're all like blah, 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 like we're all talking like none of it really makes sense right and you can't really put that audio on tv because it just sounds like it, it just doesn't sound right so they would have to then step us back and so sometimes they'd want us to re-explain and like that was very difficult to do because we're like well we just had this experience. I don't really feel like trying to talk about it again. You know, like it already happened. It was like uncomfortable sometimes and it was just weird, but like that was the process, right? That was how they were able to document what was going on and what was happening. But at times it made us look like we were acting or we were making stuff up. 
Um, or like we would walk into something and we'd find something and, and they wanted to try to get our reaction to that because they're just following us around. And so they would try to like reposition the cameras before they lost sort of that like hysteria or whatever it is. Um, and, but you know, the other thing too, that got lost in translation a little bit, we touched on this earlier in the show is the whole reason we were out there. Um, and mind you, I, I was along for the ride to help these guys and you just kind of give them pointers and keep them safe. And if, you know, we had some wildlife dealings and I'd be there to deal with it, but um, they were out there to, rediscover and explore and figure out where the old town site was, where certain facilities and buildings were, where did they get their water? Where was the cannery? Where was the church? Where was the school? And they try to document like, how did they live in this environment? Because you'd think, I mean, even back into the 1950s, right? Like one thing Alaska does is like our history just dissolves. It's weird. Like you, you, you don't have to go back very far in Alaska history to find out where it's just missing. Whereas you go into the East Coast and there's history there for hundreds of years, like very detailed documented history and buildings to prove it still. Um, so they had to go back and figure out where all this stuff was. Where did they live? How did they move around? How did they actually truly live in this environment? That's what we were there for. We were there to find these things, to explore, to document this stuff while we're having all these weird paranormal, you know, crazy experiences happening at the same time that they're trying to document and kind of like what you were saying is like that was the premise of the show and as this stuff started to compound and happen they're like okay yeah let's roll some of this in but to jeff's point you know when you're trying to pack in you know 60 80 hours worth of filming into a 44 minute episode like for every one crazy thing you guys saw on the show there's like hands down legit probably another 10 or 20 things that happened that didn't get on the show. And sometimes there were things that were much more crazy than what they did put on the show. So like, as the guys that lived it, we ate, slept and breathed that stuff on a daily basis. We know what happened out there. And sometimes they would put something in the show and we're like, okay, well that's cool. But why didn't they put this other thing in? Because it was even more bonkers and more crazy, but it's just how they have to go through. They have to find it. They know what I guess makes good TV, what's going to, you know, be portrayable to people and maybe make sense. And quite frankly, um, I think some of the stuff that happened, had they put that in the show, then it, it just might have just been people would have just been like, what? <laughs> like, what is even going on? Like, it may have been too crazy, I guess, in other words. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, th uh, if I can, this, this actually leads to. Uh, of course, there was only one season, eight episodes of the show, and uh, and because of, of COVID and all these other world events going on, uh, the show was not taken on renewed for a second season, and and yet because I I think despite what we were just talking about, I think most people who watch the show realize it is really real. They are real people that there is a real interest in it. There is a Facebook page, a uh, fan page on Facebook. How many, Kyle, what, 20,000 20, fan members now? Yeah, it was like 20,000. Yeah, and so uh, we're all hoping to that that the, the show does get renewed. And so uh, in addition to being open to appearing on, on The Edge, uh, upcoming, we're hoping to have some some Q and A podcasts specific to the show. So I, I invite your your uh, your your viewers to to find the Facebook page Alaskan Killer Bigfoot, and they're taking suggestions for topics for these these Q and As. And so we I'm not sure when when the, the first set of these little broadcasts is going to be kyle isn't either some of this depends on fans actually asking questions and yeah. then compiling them up uh so we, we want that to happen there are so many things from from my end the strictly historical end um you know and, and kyle's end we separate set of questions we want answered and we w part of the programming is what did the fans want to want questions want answered i mean there's the there's the coin that that ash found dating centuries and whereas the 15 to 1600s uh theoretically the spaniards and the english weren't up in the gulf of alaska were they uh and yet 
here you find a, a coin that old because the the historically documented Spanish expeditions is in the late 1700s. So are the English. So uh, to me, those are the questions. The obelisk. Uh, when did that get put in? I mean, if if people ask these questions, that gives the show producers and and Kyle and DJ and Keith uh, kind of something to to look for in addition to. Is it safe for everybody to move back and how are they going to make a living? Absolutely. Yeah. And I want to, if I can, I want to just add something really quick about the coin. Um, mm -hmm. So I, we've, we've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, so if somebody was there in the 1700s and, you know, they had, you guys found a coin from the 1500s, it's just because somebody happened to have it with them and they dropped it in this pit that we found, right? Um, but I ask you, on a daily basis, although we don't really have cash and coins in our pocket like we used to even maybe five, 10 years ago, but when you did, did you walk around with 100 and 200 year old coins in your pocket to where you would just drop it? No. I mean, you didn't and neither did they, right? Somebody back then wouldn't have a 200 year old coin just kicking around in their pocket. Um, so what's up with that, right? How do we, as Jeff's saying, 200 years previous to documented Spaniards or whoever being there, why was there a coin from the 1500s at the bottom of this super crazy weird pit? Which yeah. I will I will say it's not an outhouse, it's not a freaking halibut cold fish storage thing. Um, somebody spent a lot of time building this and engineering it to make this thing extremely durable and sturdy and last. Um, hand joinery, you know, pieces fitting together perfectly. Um, it stood the test of time to where it's still there today, holding the earth back. In Alaska, earth is very, very destructive. We get frost heaves, like it literally destroys roads. So somehow this pit has, has maintained itself. Somebody's not going to go build an outhouse and put that kind of time into digging a pit and you know, the other thing was like, oh, like there used to be people that would, you know, fish halibut and then they would cold store it, you know, on, in the Portlock area. You wouldn't be able to fit m more than maybe 10 halibut in that pit. So why, like that doesn't make sense either. Right. So like it's just it's just bizarre. Right. And what what the heck was that coin doing in the bottom of it? Um, there's just so many things. And that's like, you know, with this whole second season thing, like there's things that we have not been able to reveal to anybody. There's things that we found that still nobody knows except us, the people that were out there. Um, and there's things that happen that people don't know about. And we want to be able to share that information because we can't just sit here right now and share it. This has to be sort of cataloged and sort of put into a second season for us to be able to share it with the world, so to speak, not to mention sort of finish what we started out there, or at least continue on the journey and the path of trying to finish what we, or at least work on what we started to work on out there. Because like I said, we'd go out to try to answer a question and we'd come back at the end of the day with 10 to 50 more questions just because of all the weird stuff we'd find. Yeah, and, and Kyle and I need to go camping overnight on that one island in the middle of yeah. the lagoon. Um, the And this came from one of our earlier discussions. Uh, one of the other, one of the other, tales that that came out historically about portlock is uh this one woman uh a tall woman with with black hair who seemed to appear out of out of a rock face and uh and and her her domain is also supposed to be that one island out there in the lagoon and so uh and and kyle informed me no you're not going to swim out there because the current is going to take you right out to wow. sea so um uh, I would, I would, if we do that, Kyle, I, I will see if I can't find a nitro express rifle too, just in case. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would definitely, um, I definitely would be open to do it. I think it would be really cool. There's something, there's something about that Island that, um, has, it's got to have some kind of connection to port lock, but there's, there's something very, there's something very energetic about that island. Um, I can't really explain it other than like I could not help myself but to always look at that thing um, whenever I was out there. And I had no idea about this woman in black or this like lady in their cloak and all this stuff that that Jeff told me after the fact. Like the stuff I learned about like after I was out there, like 
I mean, had I known that prior to going out there, I would have had a completely different perception. Like, I didn't know any of this stuff. I just went out there like, cool, it's another bear guard job. Like, yep, let's go. Um, and then, you know, just it, one crazy thing after another started happening. <laughs> you would have either doubled your fee or stayed home. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's, I don't think I would have stayed home because I, I would have had too much FOMO. Um, and I would have been just more intrigued, but th they didn't even tell me um, this whole Bigfoot angle until the day before we went out there. Um, and you can see that in the interview where I'm sitting on the back of my truck and they're like, yeah, so like they think, you know, the people out there think this is, uh, you know, Bigfoot. And I'm just kind of like, okay, yeah. So it's the first <laughs> time I'm hearing this, nobody's told me anything about this. This should be interesting. And like next morning, like, let's go, you know, kind of thing is like sort of how to, how the whole thing was going down, but you guys have been so gracious with your time here. I have two last questions here and then I think we're going to wrap it up. So, um, uh, first of all, I have a comment here and it says, I lived in Alaska for 10 years. My neighbor had a gold mine claim. He was killed out there on it and whatever attacked him ate him to the point where there was nothing left to bury. They said it was a bear. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, not having some more details about it, it's hard to say, but typically, um, not to get too gruesome, but typically what bears do when they, um, kill something to, with the, with the intention of eating it is they do a thing called caching. So they will actually, um, kill whatever the animal is, whether it's a moose or another bear or a human or whatever. Um, and they will dig a hole um, in the earth and then they will um, bury um, that kill in the hole and they'll actually cover it up with like grass. I've, I've seen bears actually building these caches before and they'll scrape, they'll spend a very, they're very methodical and very slow and it's actually really interesting to watch them do it, but they'll literally scrape grass like very like ma in a manicured like fashion to build this like, and they'll go around in the circle and they'll build this big pile of grass up um, over their hole. And then they will, um, protect that cash. Um, and in fact, that's one of the, out of the number two maulings, um, for bear attacks and maulings, um, at least in Alaska, um, coming up on a bear on its food cache is one of the most common ways to get mauled. Because when you come up on that, um, they don't know you're a person or whatever. They just assume you're another bear trying to get their food. So they just attack you. Um, so if they, if, if it did kill this gentleman and it didn't cash him and it just something just straight up killed him and just sat there and ate it all, um, I would suspect it, especially to be nothing left, um, I would say, I mean, most commonly that was not a bear. Very good. And then can either of you speak real quick on uh, what happened to the shack at the end of the show? Did it burn down? I'll just say I was not there. Um, as you guys remember, I had already had to leave prior to that. Um, obviously, I've talked to the guys um, that were there, um, that that were witness um, and experienced that. And all I can say is uh, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And I didn't believe them when they told me. And that is sort of the that's why we need we really need a season two um people need to know about about that circumstance for sure and i they won't tell me either so there we go <laughs> yeah, i can't keeping and i their can't secrets. i can't and i can't say what i was told so um hopefully you guys will find out hopefully we can we can start pulling the, the layers of the onion back a little bit more on a lot of the stuff for you yeah, if if people, I hope people are curious. If they've not seen the show, if you're curious now, uh, it's on Discovery Plus, a uh, number of platforms. Mm -hmm. and, and if you want to see more, uh, go to the go to the rate this show, go to the comments and, and say so because uh, the studios don't know how popular a show is and, unless they get feedback from their own websites. Uh, and so that's one of the ways. It take I know in America today it takes ten minutes of your time to go online and, and write a comment, and and even even what we might think of as negative comments if they're honest go ahead and put them up there. Uh, that way we know what you want to see. Yep. 
rewatch it as well. I know, uh, you know, their their watch hours and stuff on the platforms and stuff count a lot towards that. So if you can get it to trend again on Discovery Plus and uh, the other streaming platforms, that goes a long way into to legitimizing the the need for a second season as well. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's and like the thing I would add to that too is, um, I mean, for the for the people that truly want to see another season. Um, yeah, leave comments about it, but just blow up social media. Just be super vocal about it. If you're, I mean, as, as crazy as it sounds, if, if we have a lot of people that are essentially kicking and screaming and, you know, beating their chest saying, hey, I want this show to come back, I want it back, then there's people that are going to need to listen to that, right? So if, if the general public speaks, um, that's, what, that's what they listen to. Yeah, absolutely. Very good, guys. Um, so definitely go check that out. Go rewatch it. If you haven't already, uh, check it out to begin with. And if you have watched it, watch it again. Um, so definitely awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming on today. You're you're both a wealth of knowledge with your history and all the folklore and legends, Jeff and uh, Kyle, for all your your knowledge of bears and you know just the local stuff and that. That's that's really interesting, and I appreciate your input on everything today. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for, it's been great. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Definitely. I'd love to have you guys back and then uh, have more of the guys on and best of luck to you guys. And hopefully you guys get a season two and, and we get some more stuff and awesome. I, I can't wait. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Me you. too. Thank you, Jeff. Bye. Have a great day. See you guys. All right. Thank you, Kyle. You have a great Bye. day as well. You too. Thank you. All right, guys, that is our show for this week. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, unfortunately, we only had two from the show, uh, but uh, I think it was a great show. I, I really do. I know Jeff and Kyle had a lot of great information for all of us today, and uh, I definitely love to have both of them back to talk to them individually as well, because I know there's so much more information that each of them has beyond just the show, Alaskan Killer Bigfoot, and uh, we can have a lot of fun and a lot of uh, interesting stuff with both of them. So guys, if you like that, put it in the comments of the show, send us a message, and uh, let us know that you'd like to see more from both of those guys, and we will definitely do that as well. So until next time, Time, guys next week uh it is going to be a pre-recorded show i am going to be in cryptid con uh down in lexington kentucky this friday saturday and sunday coming up so i will be driving on monday and i will not be able to be here live for you guys but i do have a recorded show all set ready to go and it is one of my newest team members at cryptids anomalies and the paranormal society it is chris mccreary is going to be on the show and he has a very interesting Bigfoot encounter that got him started into Bigfooting and the world of cryptozoology. And uh, he's going to share that on the show for you next week. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy that as well as his uh, fiance is from the Philippines and she has, uh, well, he shares some of her experiences and family stories growing up of some very weird cryptids over there. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy the show. And then uh, we are live back again in two weeks, but uh, next week, you get a pre-recorded, sorry, but uh, I'm going to be a Crypticon. So until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching the show. Thank you for being a part of it, and I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, I'll see you on the edge.